Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. So glad you could join us on Facebook Live. I trust you've had a great week and things are going well. Just a big shout out to all our veterans. I want to say thank you for all that you've done and uh, how you served our country so valiantly. We honor you and we just say thank you. You're our heroes and uh, we bless you for your service to our country. Also, just a reminder of the Operation Christmas Child. Uh, you can actually, if you want to be a part of that, as we're getting ready to close that down in the next couple of weeks, uh, but uh, send a gift to a child in another part of the world. What a great way, right, to be a be a blessing to somebody else in need. And you can go to the website, even uh, there, Operation Christmas Child, and even fill out a box there on the website. So great way to give into the world. Well, hey, listen, I just want to jump into our message today. We're going to start a little series called Good News for a World in Crisis. <laughs> I think it'd be a great, a great, uh, a great thing to talk about. I, I want to before we even go any further. I, I, I ask you a question: Have you ever maybe taken something for granted that you really didn't know that you had taken for granted before? Uh, maybe um, a relationship. Um, you really didn't know how much you valued the relationship until, unfortunately, you blew it and lost the relationship, and uh, never was the same again. Perhaps uh, it was a job you had, right? You know, you had a great job, but man, some things happened. You got crossways with another employee, the boss, and you checked out and went somewhere else. And uh, two or three months later, you'd give anything to have that job back. Or maybe uh, maybe another situation, maybe it was a, uh, a, a house you lived in, right? You know, and, and some neighbors moved in, and you didn't like them. And you just said, man, we got to get out of here. And you moved away and got another house. And oh, my goodness, now... You wish you lived back in that house. Sometimes we make decisions, don't we, just really randomly, quickly, and don't even think about the ramifications of that, and we don't really value some things that we probably should have valued all along. I want to tell you a story. It's a true story, actually. I shared it a few years ago, but just it's one of my favorite stories, uh, has become one uh, s- since I heard it. And it's a, really about a man who owned a farm in the South Africa parts, and uh, he had heard stories of people that had found gold uh, all throughout um, different parts of the world and other minerals and diamonds and things like that. And so, man, he just was really intrigued by that and got really tired of his farm and just being a farmer and just was allured by the idea that, you know, if he could just, you know, if he could just mine some things, that he could become a multimillionaire and and discover gold, discover diamonds, things like that. And so, so he sold his farm, sold his farm, and went on a journey to find, to find diamonds and to find gold uh, and to mine these out and become a multimillionaire. Well, he traveled throughout the world, um, actually, on his journey. Finally, he ends up in Europe, and he has exhausted all of his money. He's out of money, he has no resources, nothing left, and he has not found any gold, any diamonds, nothing, anywhere. And he's so depressed that he literally jumps off a bridge and kills himself. Sad story. Meanwhile, the farmer who had, the man who had bought his farm and was farming his old farmstead, um, was just, you know, going about business, doing what farmers do, and had a friend come over from town and was visiting with him. And so he gone into, the farmer had gone into the kitchen to make his friend some tea because that was the custom. And so he was making his friend some tea. His friend was out in the living room and just kind of looking around the living room, the farmer's living room, as people do when they're sitting there waiting. And um, he noticed some, some, some things up on his mantle. He went up and walked over to the mantle of the fireplace and saw some so it's a beautiful, beautiful rock. And uh, he goes, hey, what, what, where, where, where'd you get this? And he, the farmer making the tea, stuck his head in the living room and goes, oh, yeah, I found that down the stream, down behind the house here. I just crossed in the little stream and caught my eye, and I thought it was pretty cool, so I just set it up there on the mantel. The man knew a little bit about gems, and he said, um, would you mind if I took this to a jewelry friend, jewelry friend of mine 
and uh, just kind of, I think this is, uh, this is an interesting piece of rock here that you got. He goes, yeah, whatever. So he packed it up and took it to his friend, only to find out that that was one of the largest diamonds anyone's ever found in the earth. And little did this farmer know that he literally was sitting on top of an, a, a diamond minefield. I, 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 the, the whole ground was filled with diamonds. The diamonds, so many, they were literally floating to the top of the, of the ground. And the sad story is that the man who originally owned the land, looking to make his millions by mining out gold and diamonds in the ground throughout the world, was sitting on the very ground that he was looking for. Isn't it something in our life, sometimes we value something, uh, but we don't value it here. We don't value it in our own life. We don't value it with our friend. We don't value it in the relationship uh, with our community or neighbors or our job. And we lose the very thing that we really should have valued. I wanna talk about that for just a second because if we do not value some specific things in our life, it can really hurt us in the long run. Or if we do value it, it can really bless us as well. I wanna, I wanna open today and, and um, I wanna talk to you about the fear of God. And here's what I would say. <laughs> Don't touch, just watch. Don't touch, just watch. Uh, have you ever seen children and, you know, you have to teach children, right, how to respect fire. They don't know anything about fire. They don't know about heat. You have to teach a child not to touch the stove, not to touch the fire. It, it hurts. But at the same time, the very thing that it could hurt them it also could bless them. And so you have to teach them how to respect water, how to respect fire, how to respect these kind of things. And so in the Bible, uh, just give you a background, years had gone by and Israel now had become a nation, and, and the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the Philistines. And the Philistines had felt like they, they had in their possession now one of the prime things that anyone could, could have. They, they had the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, uh, Israel's, Israel's key, I guess you could say, to, to, all, uh, to, to their whole country, their whole nation was was evolved around the tabernacle, the, the Ark of the Covenant. So anyway, the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen uh, by some missteps um, that Israel had made. The Philistines had captured it, and <laughs> everywhere this Ark went, it brought havoc upon the Philistine city. So finally, they just kind of threw it off into a corner somewhere in kiriath Jerem, and it's there now, while well, it's just sitting there abandoned, uh, getting cobwebs over in a corner somewhere of somebody's farm, uh, that David now becomes king. And David, now the new king of Israel, his first act as a king is, you know what, guys? We're going and we're going to go get that Ark of the Covenant. We're going to go get the Ark because that's where God's presence is dwelling in the earth. It is the center of our country. It's everything we're about. We're going to go get that ark. We're going to bring it back and put it here in Jerusalem, our capital, and everything's going to evolve around that ark. We're going to build a, uh, a tent and then eventually perhaps a temple, and we're going to really allow God's presence to, to be elevated in our country. We have lost God in our, in our country. And so that's what they decided to do. First act out of the chute. And so they went out, got that ark, and they had people from all across the country coming, and they had a crowd of people, and they're coming down the road. They got the Ark of the Covenant. They're celebrating. They're partying. They're having a great time. It's, life is good. Oh, life is good. Can't wait to get to Jerusalem. They get to a place not too far away from Jerusalem, and, and the the oxen that was pulling the cart, which the Ark of the Covenant was on, the oxen stumbled. The oxen stumbled, the cart shifted a little bit, and the Ark began to kind of sway, wobble. In the process of that, a guy by the name of, um, his, his name was Uzzah. Uzzah just nonchalantly reached his hand out to stabilize the Ark, 
And when he did, everything changed. He reached out his arm to stabilize the arc. The arc, as soon as he touched it, it was like 500 volts of lightning struck him and he immediately was dead. He just fell to the ground dead. I mean, can you imagine? Everyone's having a party, 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 having a great time. Woo, life is good. And then they look back at the ark. A man stabilizes the ark and he falls dead. And suddenly people are gasping. What, 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 what just happened? Women are screaming. Uh, somebody perhaps jumps down and tries to give him CPR. Uh, it's, uh, the music stops. David's standing there in total disbelief, the king. And David says, you know, enough is enough. Everyone go home. Suddenly, this party has just ended, tragically. And a man lies there dead. And David didn't know what to think. He was actually angry at God. He doesn't understand how this could have happened. He doesn't know what to do. So he, he looks over and he sees a house over there. And he says to his guys, Go put this ark over there in that guy's house and let's go figure out what this is all about and we'll come back and get it later. <laughs> so, so they're like, okay. So they take the ark over to this guy's house who, need, who happens to his name was Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom, if you can imagine, I can see how that whole pl thing played out. He hears a knock on the door, he goes to the door. Some guy standing there, official guys, some officials, they said, hey, look, we're... With King David, we're his representatives, and this is his assistant. Uh, we got we got an ark here, the ark of the our ark of the covenant. The presence of God is here, and um, and and we need to put it right here uh, in your house. Can we put it in your house? Well, how how why you want to put the ark of the covenant here? Well, because uh, it just killed somebody, you know. Uh, so can we just put it in your house? Well, uh, I, I guess if I have to. Uh, just put it there in the dining room. <laughs> so they hauled this Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God in the earth, and put it in his, in his house. And I can imagine the conversation nobody Edom's having with his children and his wife. His wife comes and what in the world is that? Um, the Ark of the Covenant? Like, the children, what is that, Dad? Don't touch it. Don't you ever touch that thing. I mean, this... What in the world is going on in this? With it? What is this? And, and so I can imagine him just kind of sitting there during the day, just, you know, eating his soup and looking over into the dining room and looking at that thing. And I can imagine uh, all the kind of thoughts he was having <clears throat> about that piece of furniture that was now added to his house. And then things begin to happen in his life. The Bible tells us that that the favor of God began to be poured out upon this man. I, I don't know exactly how that looked like, but it would look something perhaps like um, um, his daughter comes home from school and says, Dad, look, I got all straight A's. She never made an A in her life. He goes, what? Really? And he looks over into the living room, the dining room, sees that ark. His son comes in a few days later. Hey, Dad, I just made the football team. He looks over at that living in the dining room, sees that ark. His wife comes home a few days later. Sweetheart, you're not going to believe it. I was at Dillard's. I found a cell that you're not going to believe. I bought 50 pair of shoes for $5. You did what? That's right. $5. $5 a pair of shoes? No, $5 for 50 pair. What? No one does that. What? Are you kidding me? She's hauling all these shoes. Things are happening. He gets a knock on the door, perhaps from his friend, his neighbor next door. Hey, Joe. Yeah. I mean, Obed, Obed Edom. Yeah. What's up, Joe? I, you know, you made me an offer on that 80 acres, the farm next door that I live in. Yeah. You made me a really low offer. <laughs> yeah. He goes, well, I want you to know that I need to move to North Israel. I need to spend some time. My kids were selling the farm. I'll give it to you for half price. Are you kidding me? And I'll even throw all the cattle in with it. I mean, things begin to happen left and right in Obed-Edom's house, blessings after blessing after blessing, because that's what happens when the presence of God comes into your home, right? <laughs> he, his wife says, sweetheart, guess what? 
is what my, my, the, my, I don't know what's going on, but that arthritis I've had in my knee, it's all gone. I don't know what's going on. I, I don't have any arthritis. Everything's fine. And, 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 and he's, he's experiencing the back pains that he's had is gone. And every, all, everything's, the old cow down in the barn that he thought he was going to have to one day slaughter is now somehow resurrected and is now offering milk again. Everything has changed. His corn is growing twice as fast as everybody else's. His life, his farm, everything is being blessed. Because why? The presence of God is in their heart, in their lives. And so after about three months, David comes back and he gets to the ark. And the story continues. Well, the point I want to make really is that in this whole process that we say, saw here play out in front of us. God was trying to tell the nation of Israel, listen, there's some things that you got to get right first before we go any further. And one of the things that you're going to have to understand is that there has to be a fear of God that precedes your procession. You cannot bring my presence into your city, into your, into your capital, without there being a pure fear of God. Now, now I don't believe Uzzah understood that, the, the man that touched the ark. I, I believe he was perhaps like many of us. We take for granted, we don't value the very thing that we say we serve and that we say is our God and which we say is our Lord. Look at this. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. In my prayer time, even this week, I, you know, a lot of things have been going on recently in our current events, as you're well aware. And in, in my personal conversation with the Lord, I'm, I'm asking the Lord, God, show me, talk to me, what's going on? What? What, 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 what do I need to know about this time? And you know, there's a lot of things that I think perhaps God could tell me, but the only thing I could hear from the Lord personally this week was the sense that we need to return to the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. I'm like, the, well, God, that really doesn't have anything to do with the current events. And, and, and I felt him challenge me. and go, no, it absolutely does. It has everything to do with what's going on, because the spiritual awakening has to begin with the fear of the Lord, just like in David's time. If you're going to have a spiritual awakening, if you're going to put God back into the culture, if, you're going to, if your desire is to see God reform the culture, then it begins with a healthy respect and understanding of who it is that you're actually serving. It begins with the fear of the Lord, because if you don't fear, you won't learn. And so we need the fear of God in our lives. And guess what? I want you to know that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Because here's the deal. God longs to have a relationship with you and to, with me. In fact, James chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw near to me, guess what? And I'll draw near to you. Well, that puts the onus on who? On God? No. It puts the onus on you and me. I draw, and then he draws near to me. In other words, the depth or the level of my relationship that I have with God really is on me. Whatever kind of depth of relationship I want to have with God is up to me and my ability to draw unto him. And he longs to have a relationship with you. In fact, James 4, 5 says that he jealously longs for the spirit that he has caused to dwell in us. Psalms 139, I have to read this portion of scripture. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Now get this. How precious to me are your thoughts. <laughs> you know, the, the, the fact that, God, you're even thinking of me. How, how precious is that? In fact, how vast is the sum of these thoughts that you're thinking of and about me? 
were I to account these, were I, were I to somehow be able to count these thoughts that you're having towards me, uh, they would outnumber the grains of sand in the earth. What? They would outnumber, God's thoughts towards you would outnumber the grains of sand in the earth. Now that, that sounds like a great analogy, but, let, but let's just take a little bit further. Did you know, if you took one cubit of sand, just all, grab one cubit of sand, one cubit wide, one cubit high, one cubit long, and, and you put it in a box of just nothing but grains of sand down in, in Gulf Shores or wherever, do you know how many grains of sand that would be? 1.8 billion grains of sand. That's just one cubit. Now, now, now think of all the sand in the world. 1.8 billion times, times bi trillions of cubits of sand. And this is how much God's thoughts are towards you. He, you can't even imagine how much God is thinking about you all the time. Thought, 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 thought. His mind, his eye, how he does it is only his ability to do because that's what makes him God. But God loves you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. But that relationship requires a foundation and that foundation is the fear of God. There must be this reverence for, for God. In fact, it says in Psalms 89, in the counsel of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. John 14 talks about his manifest presence where you literally can sense and feel almost his presence with you. There are times in my life where I literally have felt the presence of God. There, there are many times where, where I'm a fully aware of God's presence in my life and in the situation or even the atmosphere that I'm in. It's a tangible presence. And there have been times where I have not felt his presence as well. And God wants us to be aware of him. But it begins with this reverence for God, this fear of God. We, we, we can't take God for granted. It's like, like he's our, our buddy. He's like in our back pocket. Like, a, I, I, I'll serve him when I want. I, I, you know, I, I don't need to honor him. I, I don't need to obey the first commandment, which is to love God with everything we have. I mean, we, 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 all, we make sometimes God as if he's an option. Eh, and it's okay if, if, if I, I don't honor him with all my heart. Let me tell you something. There was, in the Old Testament, there was only six people that were allowed to go into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies. Moses, Aaron, and his four sons. Six people. And two of those guys, Aaron's, two of Aaron's sons, Aaron was the high priest. He had two, four sons, two of his sons. They were going in, and they were just, you know, putting um, incense on the altar of incense and what created perfume in the holy place. And they were just, you know, and one day they're like, you know what, today, why don't we add some different types of spices to this uh, altar of incense? Let's just, let's just go in and do what we want to do. And they went in, and the Bible says they, they, they brought in, um, they, they profaned the president, they, they offered profane fire unto the Lord, is what the Bible says. Profane fire, you know what profane means? To treat something holy as if it's common. And so they went in nonchalantly, uh, you know, this is just ritualistic, this is just a duty, this is just something we do. And let me tell you, if that is your relationship with God, it's just something you do, it's just nonchalant, it's just whatever, let me tell you something, this is a scary place to be. They offered profane fire, and you know what happened? They don't, that, that was it for them. They literally had to, they, they, they had to drag them out as well. God says, I'm not going to have a relationship with somebody that thinks I'm just common. I'm your God. I am the king of all kings. I am the creator of the universe. And somehow in our day-to-day -day thinking, we forget that we are serving that kind of a God. And so we, can't, we have to understand that fear does not mean that I'm scared of God. I'm not scared of God. That, that's not what that fear means. It means that that I'm terrified not to be with him. That's what fear of God actually means. I'm terrified of the thought that he's not with me. 
the fear of God, of the fear of losing something so valuable in my life that is the core and the essence of who I am. The Bible says that Moses had an experience with God out in the desert, right? And in a burning bush. And, and what does God do? God says, now I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to pull those people out of bondage. And I want you to bring them back to this very place where you've met me so they can meet me as well. So Moses is like, yeah. So he brings them out. It doesn't take them to the promised land first. He takes them to the desert first because you got to know the promiser before you know the promised land. And so he brings them to the to the point where he had met God and experienced God. And, and now they come to Mount Sinai and the mountain's on fire and there's thunder, there's lightning, and all this stuff's going on. And Moses is like, hey, hey, come on. We get to experience God. And people are like, ah, we don't want to have nothing to do with God. You, Moses, you, 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 you talk to God for us. I can imagine God's heart was broken. I mean, God wants to, he wants to be our God. He wants to, to, to be known. And that's why the Bible says that Moses knew the ways of God. Israel, all they knew was what God did, but Moses knew why God did. Moses wanted to be, Moses became the friend of God. Abraham became the friend of God. Uh, it, it's amazing when you read about these characters and people in the Bible that they really lived their lives in such a way where God became their friend. And, and they became God's friend. And that's where God is calling us to be, a people that tremble at his word, who fear him, but tremble at his word. You know the word, to tremble at his word, you know what it means? to Just to obey him instantly. To, to obey even if it doesn't make sense. To obey even if it hurts. To obey him even if there's no benefits involved. And to obey to the completion of the, the command. Tremble at his word. Genesis 22, 12 talks about this kind of faith that Abraham had. He, go kill your son, your only son Isaac. Early the next morning, quickly, he gets up, he trembles at his word, he obeys God. He goes and he does that. As he's putting a knife up to kill his son, God says, stop, stop. I'm changing my mind. Because why? Because now I know what? You fear me. And that's when the nation of Israel started. When God realized he had a man who feared him who would obey him instantly, even to the completion of the command. Do you obey the Lord that way? And do you fear God like that today? I, I really believe God wants to ask that question to you as he is asking to me, as he's asking even to our nation. Will you fear me? Do you fear my presence in such a way that you're not terrified of me, but you can't bear the thought of not being with me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Listen, you can't even begin to figure out what's going on around here right now if you don't have the fear of God. Wisdom comes from the Lord, but it starts with the fear. I believe today what the Lord wants us to understand is that we cannot be nonchalant about our relationship with him. Not a, we can't be an Uzzah that just nonchalantly stretches our hand out and tries to stabilize God as if we, we have some ability to, you know, make God do what we want to do. We can't be like Aaron's sons who go in nonchalantly into his, God's presence and just offer whatever kind of incense we want to offer. We are serving a powerful God. We are serving a God who causes kings to come and kings to uh, descend. He is a God that creates breath in our lungs, keeps the sun in its place, keeps the earth on its axis. We are serving an incredible God. And God desires us to know him. And it begins with fear, the fear of the Lord, the reverence for him. Today, my challenge is for you and for me as well. Will we fear him afresh? Perhaps you've never accepted Christ in your life. Can I tell you that it begins in humility by you bowing your heart to him, bowing your life and saying, God, come into my heart, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life. For everyone here this morning that's watching, I want to just pray with you. And I'm 
I'd just like for you to bow your heads with me and close your eyes and, and let's just go to the Lord for a moment. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, we come and we bow before you. And in many ways, Lord God, we have not feared you. We have not reverenced you to that degree where we draw near unto you, where we, we couldn't bear the thought of not having you in our life. We've not valued you like the farmer didn't value his own farm full of diamonds. And Father, we understand today that if we're going to move forward as a person, as a family, as a church, and as a country, it begins with the fear of God. The foundation is the fear of God. This amazing master that you are, that we get to love and know and serve. Father, forgive us for being profane with you. Forgive us for treating you nonchalantly, for treating your word nonchalantly, treating your presence nonchalantly, not even, even hungering for you many times. Father, we humble ourselves. This is what you're looking for. You're looking for a people that will stop and just humble yourself. And we humble ourselves before you because, Lord, we need you. Bless our country, bless our family, bless our church, bless our community. And we give you all the thanks, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. So glad to have you with us this morning. Have a great day, have a great week, and have a wonderful, wonderful time in your walk of fear with the Lord. God bless.